I was at a point where I find your website basically where I thought that I may never have sex again in my life because I just uh, didn't know what, what was wrong with me. And when I found your site, I had the same reaction that so many guys do, which is like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I'm not alone. It, 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 was, it was cathartic. So, so I just want to say thank you. <laughs> Well, you're very welcome, and that's why my wife and I did it, because we kept hearing from guys like you who were like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm screwed up for life. And when you get emails from men who are suicidal and such, it, it, you just have to do something. So uh, we felt we had to do something. And, and how are you doing now? Hey guys, this is Abel here with the Sustainable Self-Development Podcast and as you heard from this tiny little sound clip, in today's episode we are going to talk about something quite deep and it's a topic that has certainly not been discussed here before. I'm going to talk to Gary Wilson, the man whose work, quite frankly, has changed my life. Gary is the founder of the site and now massive community, Your Brain on Porn, and he was pretty much the first one who started to talk about how internet porn can cause changes in your brain. And as a result, guys can develop serious sexual problems such as erectile dysfunction, low libido, or delayed ejaculation. Now, I know at this point, many people listening to this may be rolling their eyes already, but I will just say that this thing is very real. Uh, like you heard in the sound clip I played in the beginning, I was at a point in my life a few years ago where I could honestly not fathom how I could be able to reignite my sex life. I thought I was completely broken and when I came across his site and started to read the stories of hundreds and hundreds of guys similar to me, it was like reading my own exact story. At that point I swore that I would quit porn for good and I went on a very long recovery journey which at times was so hard that I basically had to listen to tracks where Gary and other guys were talking about this to even motivate myself to keep going. And at the end, I did recover. And so did so many other guys. And if there is even one guy out there listening to this who needs some encouragement and whom this might help, it's already worth putting this episode out there. So this will be a different kind of episode from what you've heard here before on this podcast, but this tackles a very critically important area of our lives. And we're not going to moralize here. We're not going to form judgment or tell people what they should do in their own bedrooms. This is simply going to be an informative discussion for guys who may have run into these problems and developed sexual problems as a result of porn use. So I hope you enjoy this and again, use the timestamps to navigate between the topics we discussed. And let's bring on Gary Wilson. All right. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Gary, for coming on. I'm excited to talk to you. Hey, it's great to be here. So um, for people who may not be familiar with your work and what you do, uh, please tell the story that I'm sure you've told a thousand times already. So what do you do? And um what is what is your your work uh consisting of these days well uh what do i do well i i have a website called yourbrainonporn.com and it's been around since uh, about january 2011 and i also have a book called your brain on porn um and uh yeah i mean that's the short version of what i do and the site is there to sort of fill in a gap and the gap is between what is actually occurring out in reality with people using internet porn at present and the effects of it on them and what the science is lagging behind and showing even though there is some science starting to showing starting to show some of the effects uh the purpose of my site was sort of to bridge a gap that's the short version. Of course, there's a long version of how I got into all this nonsense. Now, I'm non-religious and I'm very liberal. So you got to wonder, well, how do I get into a site that's showing the negative effects of porn? And what occurred was my wife and I had written lots of articles about the neurobiology of bonding, love, sex, et cetera. And she had a website and the website was about relationships. And on that website, it had a lot of these articles. And in these articles, it had a lot of key words, evidently such as dopamine, ejaculation, erection, addiction, reward center, because those are all, all involved with love. 
bonding, relationships. And mm -hmm. around 2006, uh, some guys started to show up on her forum and post, and her forum had nothing to do with pornography, but they said that pornography was negatively affecting them. They uh, were having sexual problems. They couldn't get an erection, or their sexual taste had morphed into really strange stuff. And she says, what are you doing here? And they said, well, this just looks like a good place to start talking about this. So she let them stay, and uh, as Google does, it puts together keywords, so it put together their posts, and more and more started showing up. And they started to quit porn in order to uh, heal their sexual problems like erectile dysfunction or low libido or delayed ejaculation. And in doing so, they started to see other benefits, such as uh, the brain fog decreased, their motivation increased, confidence increased, social anxiety went away, uh, even depression or emotional numbness went away. Uh, and of course, they had an increase in uh, desire for real partners. And the big thing is a lot of their sexual dysfunction healed. So what happened was about 2009, my wife started writing for Psychology Today. She did a few blog posts about what these guys were experiencing, and that just brought an avalanche more to her site. And she eventually said, hey, could you build a separate website where you could put up their stories, put up the science, put up uh, information, frequently asked questions, so they could just go over there and use it. So I did that, and then that blew up. I guess because there's a lot of problems with internet porn use. And then I was asked to do a TED talk and that blew up. So that's just been sort of this trail. And we, we really didn't want to get into it, but we felt compelled to get into it because there were so many people suffering and they didn't have a good source of information. Right. So um, to give people some perspective, I found your website in 2013. Now it is almost 2017. So what numbers are we talking about roughly? Like what, how many guys over the years have turned to your side for help with these problems that you just mentioned? Well, it's an excellent question, but I'm not sure about the answer. Let's see, how many visitors per day? I have about 15 to 20,000 unique visitors per day. So that's about average. And it's actually gone down in the last year, and that's because so many other uh, websites have sprung up. You know, there's Reddit NoFap and NoFap.com and Reboot Nation and many other uh, websites that carry the load. Our, our site is not a form. It doesn't contain a form. It's just an information site. So I think a lot of uh, men primarily, but also women, uh, are on those many other sites also. So it's hard to tell how many people actually have a problem because of porn because very few recognize the effects that porn has on them unless they choose to take a time out from porn. Right. So let's uh, reiterate something that you said, which is, you know, when people talk about porn, usually these moralistic discussions come up or uh, they talk about things like, well, it shapes the sexual tastes of men in weird ways and or not even the taste, the expectations for real sex in a, in a weird way. Um, what you're saying is that you don't care about any of that stuff. The problem here is that guys stop being able to use their penises because of porn use. Is that is that correct? Well, no, I wouldn't just go down to just guys and penises. I would go down to, I would also agree that it's a broader thing because it does shape sexual taste to a certain extent. Uh, one study that came out a couple of months ago asked, finally asked the question, and it found that 50% of the porn users had now escalated into stuff that they found previously uninteresting or disgusting. And many, many guys, uh, probably a majority, described that they now have escalated or gone into some really strange porn that they find often disgusting or upsetting. Uh, so it does shape sexual taste. And you could say, well, maybe they're just finding their true nature. But what occurs is they remove porn, they stop using it, and their tastes often revert to what they were prior to using porn or just getting excited by normal stuff, the shape of a woman, the smile of a face, rather than needing hardcore porn or gang rape or bestiality to get off. So it does 
shape, sexual taste. It can. doesn't mean it will, but it can. Uh, it can also shape expectations because a young man now are just growing up watching real people have real sex for years prior to having sex himself. So he now is learning all about sex through porn. And that can have negative effects on him, negative effects on his partner. So uh, my site is much broader than that, but it just started off because guys were complaining about their uh, sexual problems. Right. So um, let's, uh, let's deconstruct this a little bit. On a kind of neurobiological level, what makes internet porn so much different than real life sex? And, and why is it so much more likely to actually cause problems? Well, let's just uh, step back and look at maybe a young man in 1975, and what does he masturbate to? Well, he masturbates usually to his imagination, and maybe he's thinking about the uh, 15-year-old girl next to him in math class, and what does he think about? Well, he's never had sex, so he's thinking about maybe stealing up her boobs or God knows what, but that's the level that he can go to. Now, go to 2016, and you have a 13-year-old boy, and he gets online, and he goes to a tube site, and he can put up three-minute videos of the hardest of the hardcore, watching real people have so-called real sex, even though it's fake, and it's often violent, and it's gagging, and the woman is being dominated, or maybe the man's being dominated by females, and he is learning about this sex and he's watching real people have real sex and that's really never occurred in the history of man where a young man can can set up a whole bunch of tabs and just watch videos of really strange stuff so that's the first difference and then we look at what is unique about internet porn is that you can control your sexual arousal with a mouse in other words Let's say you're getting bored at watching a threesome, then you click on gang rape and you can immediately get arousal because it's novel. So there's tremendous novelty and novelty increases sexual arousal. It can also cause shock or surprise and both shock and surprise increase dopamine and that can increase sexual arousal. Or maybe the person goes on to something really strange and upsetting to them and that might increase anxiety, and that can increase sexual arousal. So internet porn is sort of a unique stimulus that we've never really come in contact with uh, in terms of our sexuality. Right, and, and how, how can this, which is supposedly all about sex, right? So how can this actually get people to the point where they become sexually dysfunctional when it actually comes to you know, having real sex with a real partner? Well, so uh, with internet porn, and we have to compare it to real life sex, so real life sex, you're with a partner, often your eyes are closed, or you just have a certain view. So what men are doing, so we'll focus on men, is they're conditioning their sexual arousal to everything associated with internet porn. So as I said, that would be the constant novelty, maybe seeing a hundred different scenes, a hundred different porn stars just in a session, clicking from scene to scene once they get bored, controlling their arousal with a mouse, but it's also voyeurism, watching someone else have sex, seeing the whole scene. Also, in terms of porn, you have these women who are always turned on and they're screaming orgasms all the time. Oh my God, it's so great. Well, that doesn't match reality. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and different genres of porn. So the guys will end up escalating to stuff that doesn't match real life sex in any way. They're fetishes. So maybe now they need a fetish uh, to get excited. And so none of this really matches real life sex. So you have a problem. If you have trained your brain to get aroused through all of your masturbation of porn, then it doesn't match real life sex. So there's a you know, there's a mismatch. And in that mismatch, you can't get aroused because you've trained to get aroused to something completely different. Right. And um, you kind of touched on this already, but how much do you think this um, 
basically, how much do you think this is caused by the difference in intensity of the stimulus? And how much is this caused by just simple wiring? So training your brain to the wrong sport, in a sense, uh, which, which do you think is more problematic here? Yeah, well, I think it's both. I think you can't separate it because, you know, anytime you uh, ejaculate or uh, have an orgasm, you're basically training your brain to everything that brought you that orgasm. And that's just basic neuroscience. So if it's just sitting and watching a vanilla single porn video, then you're training yourself just to watching a single vanilla porn video that may match sex. However, that rarely occurs. So if you go into what you described, the, the super normal stimulus that porn is, it's beyond anything we've evolved with, is this ability to click from video to video, uh, from genre to genre. That's what is also unique. So I think we really have both things interacting at the same time. Right. And, and what's fascinating about all of this is that in the meanwhile, and I think this is in part the reason why there's so many misconceptions about this, is that guys still find women or their partner objectively attractive. It's just some for some reason they just can't get aroused. Is, is that correct? Yes, uh, they definitely find uh, their partner objectively attractive. Maybe they see women and they go, wow, I like to go to bed with her. But once they go to bed, they're going back to their training. Okay, what aroused me? Well, if it was five years of masturbating to, you know, short clips of hardcore porn, now they aren't aroused. In fact, one of the uh, occurrences is sometimes guys will get with a new girl and in the first five minutes, they'll get an erection, but then it'll just fade away. So that's one of the first signs is, okay, I'm getting aroused because it's new and anticipation, the expectation of having sex actually releases maybe more dopamine than sex itself. And so that's when you get an erection, but then you start trying to go at it and it just doesn't match what you've trained for. So then you lose your erection. So that's often the first sign. Uh, as it gets worse, you won't be able to get an erection with a partner at any point in time. And now you know you've really uh, crossed the line. Yeah, let's talk about some of the misconceptions, actually. This is, a, this is a good point to bring this up. What are some of the common misconceptions that are commonly said about kind of porn addiction at the end, the problems that porn cause? Well, there's many misconceptions. Uh, of course, the, the one misconception, is, which we're sort of talking about, is that porn can't cause erectile dysfunction or cause sexual problems, the use of porn. But that may have been true when we just had a single Playboy that showed up once a month and you looked at the centerfold and you masturbated to it and you were done and you're bored. But that's not true anymore now that we have internet porn. Now, let's, let's look at some studies there are 17 studies on the front of my page, front page of my site, Your Brain on Porn, and it says studies linking porn use uh, to sexual dysfunctions. And there's 17 of them that have linked porn use to various sexual dysfunctions, such as low libido, erectile dysfunction, and a very common one, delayed ejaculation. Three of these studies have had men attempt to remove porn, stop porn, in order to heal their sexual dysfunction. And all three have had men recover from porn-induced sexual dysfunctions by eliminating one variable. So the science is out there, and the science is powerful. And if we look at another aspect, look at the rate of erectile dysfunction in men under 40. Well, historically, starting in 1948 with Kinsey up to the year 2000, all of the studies show a consistent rate of erectile dysfunction of about two to three percent in men under 40. Then studies started to come out around 2009, 2010, and several studies in the last five years have reported rates of erectile dysfunction in men under 40 at 24 percent, 27 percent, even 33 percent. 
So that's a 1,000% increase in erectile dysfunction in men under 40. And what variable has changed in the last 15 years that could cause that, cause it? And that could only be the spreading of internet porn and then the invention of porn tube sites around 2006. Right. And, and you know, it just came to mind that now we have these video game platforms, for example, which allow you to put on these goggles and you're basically experiencing the game 3D remarkably similar to an actual real-life experience. So you see where I'm going with this? Imagine if this gets implemented with porn. Like, what is that going to do with guys? And, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's scary. It's a scary landscape. It's a very scary landscape because even uh, many of the stories we have, we have about 4,000 stories of men, uh, long stories, who've recovered from porn and do sexual problems. And what are we talking about? We're talking about a lot of them in their 30s and, and mid-20s. So they started, some of them, before there was even tube sites. Now we have virtual reality. And looking at the forums, in the last year, some men have been reported that they were going along fine sexually. And then they got some virtual reality porn and they got the headsets, whatever those things are. And within a very short time, they started to experience sexual problems and it just scared the crap out of them. They said, my goodness, they are terrified for the up and coming generation because virtual reality is just going to be devastating, they believe. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, I, I I think it's. Uh, it, it can potentially have the the impact of reshaping evolution. Or <laughs> do you do you have a, an explanation? I always wonder about this. Why certain people seem to be just much more susceptible to this than others? Like looking back, for example, me, I already started experiencing the downsides of this as a young kid. While I have friends who seem to be able to just naturally control this without any problems, intuitively. So, I don't know, is this a matter of dopamine receptor density in their brain or, or something like that? Or what would your hypothesis be? So, are you talking about uh, those that are most susceptible to addiction or compulsive use or those that are most more susceptible to porn-induced sexual problems? Yeah, it's a good it's it's a good point you bring up. I think both both are I see big differences in both. So I I for example myself, I never escalated to really hard genres, but certainly I <laughs> I I turned to watch some watching some deviant stuff back in my porn watching days to put it euphemistically. Uh, but other guys, they just naturally they they watch the same stuff over and over again and when that's becomes boring they just stop using porn for a couple of days then return to it and so that there is big differences there but then with the sexual dysfunctional part of this there are guys like in the movie Don John <laughs> the guy watches porn day and night yet he's able to function sexually but other people seem to develop these sexual dysfunctions rather early so I guess there are differences in both domains. Well, there are because, so let's look at it. You, you can develop porn-induced sexual dysfunctions without becoming addicted. And we've seen that uh, over and over. And so there's that aspect. And uh, you can become very, very addicted without developing sexual dysfunctions. So let's talk about addiction. There's no doubt that pre-existing conditions such as depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, generalized anxiety, these will lead to a greater chance of addiction. However, uh, the most people who have these conditions never develop a, a true addiction. So, you know, they don't equal addiction. Or you can have genetic factors, uh, such as low naturally low dopamine, maybe low dopamine receptors. They've, they've come up with several genetic factors that are associated with substance addictions like cocaine, meth, heroin, etc. So yeah, there are factors also. But what occurs with addiction is just chronic use leading to brain changes. Like uh, so many of my parents' generation became addicted to smoking. 
and many of them didn't have any pre-existing conditions or genetic factors. They just continued to smoke and they became addicted and it was hard for them to quit. So youth lead to that uh, just can lead to addiction. So I think some of the factors that may be associated with uh, young men becoming addicted might be uh, how early they start. I think starting early, in fact, some that start before puberty, they tend to report uh, that it was harder to stop. And those ones also report uh, greater chances of erectile dysfunction from porn. So I think that's part of it. And obviously, if you have a, a good home life and you have lots of other activities and you're staying away from porn and maybe your parents have a porn blocker, if you can keep kids away from porn and using porn during their adolescent years, then I think there's going to be a less of a chance of addiction in general. So those are my comments on addiction, which are different than my comments on porn-induced erectile dysfunction. And when it so, comes to porn-induced Induced erectile dysfunction, many, many factors obviously uh, play into it. Because one of the main questions is, why did I develop porn-induced ED when my friend watches just as much porn as I do? Well, I mean, first of all, there's just uh, years of use. There's how early you started. Another one is the ratio of how much of your masturbation sessions were to maybe your imagination compared to how much to porn, maybe how much real sex you had during adolescence, maybe if all of your ejaculations and orgasms were to porn and none were to real people, maybe you've conditioned yourself to that, maybe large gaps in your sexual activity where you, for a couple of years, you use nothing but porn, maybe if you're a virgin or not. Uh, there's lots of... Uh, factors that play into porn-induced sexual problems that are really hard to sort of put together like uh, pieces of a puzzle, but someday maybe uh, science will, you know, figure those out more correctly. Yeah, yeah. So um, after painting this dark picture, let's uh, talk a little bit about what people can actually do to recover from this. So you can, you, you put together some amazing resources. Um, so let, let's discuss some of the steps they can take to get their sexual life back on track. I mean, obviously, the, the first one is to stop porn. I mean, when we talk about men with porn-induced sexual problems, we give them two bits of advice. And one is to stop porn, and the other is try to rewire your sexual arousal to real people. Now, the guys then ask the question, well, does that mean i got to go find... A, a partner and have sex with them? And the answer is no. Uh, if you just start, let's say you're a heterosexual, young guy, 18, if you just start thinking about girls, if you start dating girls, if you start holding hands, if you start kissing, you don't have to get an erection and have sex with a girl in order to get aroused. Uh, this is the way it's been through millennia, is men were able to get erections just fine and get aroused just fine uh, with ever, without ever having sex. So you need to move away from the artificial. Stop fan fantasizing about your porn, recalling porn, uh, not using the internet to look at YouTube videos of women jiggling or going on Facebook and clicking from picture to picture. You need to just completely unhook your sexual arousal from the internet and from the computer and start getting it in real life. Start getting aroused to real people in real situations, thinking about real people in real situations. And you may have to do more than that, but that is, are the two steps that we suggest. Right, so you also talk about, especially with guys who develop erectile dysfunction as a consequence of poor news, that many times they do have to drastically reduce masturbation or even quit it completely for a period of time. Uh, wh why is that? What, what's the deal with masturbation without porn? Yeah, well, that's, of course, the most controversial thing that is suggested. But if you read closely uh, our basic articles on yourbrainonporn.com, 
we don't necessarily suggest that. We just point to what the guys who have recovered suggest. And many of them have had gaps in masturbation. Not all. In fact, there's some men, especially men who didn't grow up using internet, who continue to masturbate and ejaculate, and they heal just fine. They're just not masturbating or ejaculating to uh, porn or thinking about porn. So this is highly variable. But a gap, a lot of the young men who grew up using porn, they find that a gap, maybe it's 90 days, maybe it's 60 days, maybe it's longer, without masturbation is helpful. But they shouldn't look at it as an either all. You know, so if you go on to Reddit NoFap, they'll say, oh my goodness, I made 30 days. <laughs> well, so what? It's no big deal. Let's look at another guy who's gone a year and he's masturbated maybe twice a month. He never makes 30 days, but that year without masturbating to porn is what healed them. So don't get caught up in the days of not masturbating or any of that stuff. I don't think that's really healthy. And the other part is going longer without masturbation may not be beneficial. You, you have a gap and then you may want, want to ideally reintroduce uh, arousal with a partner. But if you can't, then some of the suggestions are some guys will masturbate to, of course, their imagination of being with a partner. Uh, some, <laughs> some will hug their pillow and pretend that they're having sex with their pillow. I'm not kidding. Uh, what they'll do is they'll just masturbate to what it feels like, what they believe it feels like to have sex. So they're sort of training their brain to get used to the possibility of sex. So the goal here, uh, is not to go a long time without masturbation. That's not what we're talking about. The goal here is to untrain your brain from being aroused through fake stimuli and getting yourself aroused to real stimuli. And that may include a time of masturbating to your imagination, just like some of your ancestors did. Right. Yeah, I a couple of points. I mean, I so I found your resource and it's basically changed my life. I mean, it put me back on the right track a couple of years ago. And I definitely found during my recovery period that masturbation set me back. So I actually I think I, I'm pretty sure I went over a year <laughs> without without masturbation. And I, I think it helped. So let's um, let's deconstruct a little bit. Uh, the recovery process. I mean, I know how it looks like. I experienced it myself. Thousands of other guys have experienced it too. But just for the listeners, what do guys, um, in your experience, find within the first, you know, couple of weeks, months of uh, not watching porn and potentially not masturbating? How does this recovery process typically look like for these guys? Yeah, let's say someone has uh, porn-induced sexual dysfunction. And usually when they quit, of course, what occurs is within about a week or two, they start having cravings to use again. It's interesting. Uh, what occurs in the brain, uh, what they've seen is that after an addict quits, uh, they're okay for about a week. But from week two, three, four, five, the brain actually starts to sprout more connections. Uh, connection to your addictive behaviors and your reward system to try to get you to uh, do your addiction again. So cravings are natural. The other thing is withdrawal symptoms. Uh, there's a meme out there, a false meme, that there are no withdrawal symptoms with behavioral addiction. Well, that's false when it comes to internet porn addiction. We have chronicled withdrawal symptoms that are nearly as bad as drug withdrawal symptoms. And they can be, of course, the usual anxiety, restlessness, depression, lethargy, uh, all sorts of things that come up, even physical symptoms, headaches, insomnia. So that can occur and you have to be prepared for that and realize that it's going to pass eventually. The one most disturbing symptom that almost always occurs in guys who have porn induced sexual dysfunction is what they call the flat line. And that's where you have a significant drop in your libido. 
some guys even describe that their genitals feel cold, mm. that they shrink. Mm. When they look at women on the street, they say, well, they're objectively beautiful, but I feel nothing. I couldn't get erection if my life depended on it. So the flat line often occurs. It can last for a few weeks. It can last for a few months. And unfortunately, sometimes it goes away and comes back. And like you described is some guys will masturbate because uh, sometimes they choose to not masturbate to recover from porn and do sexual dysfunctions. And they'll masturbate and the flat line will come back hard and it'll be very disturbing. So what exactly causes the flat line? It's hard to tell, but it's obviously significant brain changes that have occurred at the deep limbic level. So that's one of the most significant things that they need to be prepared for is the flat line and realize that it will go away. And interesting enough, some guys find that the flat line sort of stays around and it doesn't go away until they get with a partner and they start having sex and they're going, oh my goodness, I thought I was in a flat line, but as soon as I started to get with this girl, I had an erection and it was great. So that, that, that's it in a nutshell. The, the flat line part of it is crazy. I mean, I think I'm pretty sure I've been one of those individuals who did not have an addiction, but I did develop uh, dysfunction as a result of porn use. And it's interesting, the first, and, and this is commonly what I hear a lot, of, a lot of times from different guys as well, is that for the first two, one or two weeks, I was basically, I felt like a god, actually. I felt like having sex with anything that moved around me. And then after that, I just went into this incredible in feeling of indifference about sex. I, I just remember... I, having, I remember having a, a conversation with a friend of mine who told me this crazy wild sex story that he just had. And I remember listening to that story with such absolute indifference. I just like, it was like listening to a story about eating, I don't know, raw carrots or something. It just moved nothing in me. And then all of a sudden, like you said, it just stopped. And I start, started having, you know, blue balls and <laughs> all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah the guys will come. We'll call it the dead dick and syndrome. And as you mentioned, uh, often guys feel better in the first week or maybe the second week, and then they get hit hard. And that's what often brings them back to porn. They're like, oh, my God, my life was so much better with porn. <laughs> but you've got to go through it. You know, if you've gotten to the point, if you're a young man under 40 and you can't get an erection with a real girl, your brain has significantly changed. So you just have to go through it. Yeah, and uh, so let, let's talk about the, the timelines a little bit here. You, you mentioned it a lot of times on your website that there is no cut and dry answer as, as, as to how long it will actually take to recover, but um, what kind of average numbers do you see? Yeah, there are no average numbers now. It used to be, so let's go back to 2006, 2007, 2008. The men who were uh, on my wife's website and forum, and they were quitting, and most of them were uh, 30 and over, somewhere in their late 20s. But again, this was, you know, eight years ago, so that means they'd be 35 now. They would often recover within about six to eight weeks, and that was pretty consistent. Then uh, 2012, 2013, as more young guys started to show up on these forums and report the problems, we started to see it spread to five, six months. And if you look at my TED Talk, I say, well, some young guys might take five months. Well, forget that. Now it's 2017, and we've seen some young guys take up to two years to recover from porn-induced DD. So there is no particular timeline. We have men in their 50s, and often it's men in their late 40s or earlier 50s that may need just may need just four weeks to recover yet we see some young men who are 22 who grew up using uh porn and they may need nine months a year a year and a half and what's sad about it is once they recover they're not as solid as the older man in other words if they go back to porn or uh, if they ejaculate too much in the beginning, they'll drop back into a flat line again. 
and they'll suffer ED. So it's, it's very upsetting to us, and that's our big concern is, is what's going on with the younger people who are shaping their sexuality. It's really affecting them deeply if it takes so long to recover. I guess young guys are glad when they finally are able to have sex again and they don't necessarily realize that the recovery is still going on at that point and they still need to cultivate it and kind of be mindful of the of their sexual life and sexual behavior and still do things to keep the recovery going, right? Yeah, well, think about it. So let's go back to our guy in his 50s. Well, he has years and years of experience of having sex with good erections. So, you know, it's, it's not a big deal for him. He gets back to it. He, he hasn't rewired his brain to sex, you know, to porn during adolescence. And then we have a young guy. Now, let's say he's rarely had sex. And so he's recovering and it's about a year later and he feels good and he decides to have sex and it works fine. But then he has a bunch of ejaculations in a row and then he tries to get back with his girlfriend a couple of days later and it's not working. Well, that's extremely upsetting to him because he doesn't have all those years of successful sex behind him. So then he now introduces the anxiety part. And now what you might have is not only porn-induced ED, but that's coupled with anxiety, performance anxiety, that the older man didn't have. So, you know, that's why you want to sort of start off slow so you don't try to reintroduce that performance anxiety that can come along with it for guys who are not as fortunate as I was, for example, to have, have a girlfriend who was incredibly supportive of me at the time. If you don't have a, a partner who can kind of guide you through this period and be willing to kind of reintroduce sex into your life at a pace that is kind of conducive to keep this recovery going, then it can be very challenging to, to do it on your own. And I, I guess this is also a good point to mention that recovering from this is not only a matter of quitting porn and and abstaining from masturbation but it's all also rewiring your brain to get aroused to the right thing right so so introducing the proper stimulus in the form of being with with a partner is also an important part of this it, it is especially for the younger man who grew up with porn i i know i keep saying that like a broken record but that is the fact this is the first time we've had men who've just grown up watching videos and masturbating it to, you know, starting at age 11, 12, 13 for years prior to having sex. So, yeah, uh, rewiring, you know, think about it. You know, as you mentioned, uh, in the old days, people used to get to know each other prior to having sex. So you can just revert to 1955, you know, at the advent of rock and roll and just think, hey, me and Sally that's a good name from 1955, are going to get to know each other. We're going to hold hands. We're going to kiss. You know, we're going to make out a little bit for a few months in a row. And I'm just going to continue to rewire my brain to get excited to Sally. And then maybe we'll take it a few steps further. But this is the way it used to be for a lot of couples. So, yeah, go back to the old days. Try that, try that out for a while. I find it fascinating that people can honestly think that – making it possible for guys to basically have or experience sex in a way hundreds or thousands of time by the time that they normally would get to the age when they lose their virginity. How can people actually think that this can have no consequence whatsoever? I mean, I think it's, it's more of a degree of how big of a consequence it has, uh, not so much if it has consequences at all. Well, you know, so, uh, there's lots of different aspects to answering that question. I mean, certainly there's uh, a huge industry that's promoting this. Secondly, there's uh, most of the academic uh, sex researchers and the sex therapists out there have been telling the world for a good 50 years that sexuality cannot be altered by an external stimulus. So there's some magical point where your sexuality is uh, set. And so looking at porn, even if you're masturbating to porn three hours a day, starting at age 12 and to 18, that won't have any effect on you. So they're really invested. Their reputations are invested, what they've been saying. They're completely invested in this meme 
that porn can never have negative effects and certainly can't have any effect on sexuality. But as an analogy, let's step back in time, and it wasn't very long ago where doctors were suggesting smoking uh, to help with lung conditions. Uh, doctors were in advertising to promote cigarettes. And the tobacco companies put together all sorts of institutes, the tobacco institute, to do what's called agnotology. In other words, they would throw dust up in the air. They would create experts that would talk and say, no, there's no problem with smoking. People, their lungs are black because we're using uh, asphalt on the highway, so it must be from the asphalt. So how long did it take? I mean, it was back in the 1990s where we had the seven heads of the tobacco industry before Congress, and Congress was asking them, do you think uh, cigarettes are addictive? No, sir, they all said. Do you think cigarettes cause cancer? Absolutely not. So there can be a lot of denial in in things so obvious as smoking. Uh, and it wasn't that long ago that they, the tobacco companies were still saying it's not addictive and it doesn't cause any health problems. So, you know, that's a great example of what's going on with porn, in my opinion. And, and I think it's pretty illustrative. If you look at YouTube, for example, I mean, when I found your resources, it was back in 2013, You've been already around for two years, but now if I look around, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of videos on YouTube discussing this topic. And there's obviously still a lot of skeptics, but I mean, at some point, it's <laughs> the, the, the arguments have to die because let's just look at the facts and what happens when people uh, stop using porn and what happens with their sexual life. And it's it's kind of the proof is in the pudding at that point. So um, w one last thing I wanted to touch on here um, that I definitely think is worth bringing up briefly before we wrap this up is how uh, quitting porn and, and recovering and, and um, doing all these things that we talked about can have implications for other things such as social anxiety potentially. Yeah, that, that was one of the, the most you know, fascinating things is that the men who showed up on my wife's site or the men who are doing it right now on NoFap, like go to Reddit NoFap and you'll see mostly young people. And you'll see that the majority of them uh, do not have sexual problems. So why are they quitting? Well, of course, you hear on NoFap they're quitting because they want their superpowers. Well, of course, what are superpowers? That's feeling normal. Mm -hmm. And for reasons that, of course, we don't understand uh, neurologically, though we could make some guesses, is that many people uh, who give up porn, uh, especially young people, they see improvements in many areas. One of the most common, uh, some of the most common, of course, is more motivation, more energy, more confidence, uh, less social anxiety, wanting to socialize more. One of the other most common one is they feel more alive. They don't have emotional numbness. Uh, music sound, sounds better. Uh, colors look brighter. And of course, uh, sexual partners look a lot more interesting. So even some of them uh, who, ha who are on medication for ADHD or medication for depression, they have gotten off their medication and those conditions have improved significantly. So that's been the most surprising uh, aspect of all this. And of course, the most controversial uh, of this, but we have seen this over and over thousands and thousands of times over the last 10 years. So it's not a placebo, especially when in the early years, people didn't even know that others were experiencing these benefits. They would just get on the forums and go, oh my God, I, I quit. And now uh, my social anxiety has decreased, or my goodness, I can, my grades have improved, and I can think clearly, and I can concentrate, and I can read. And over and over and over again, they report these same benefits. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it's it's it, it's really interesting. I think maybe some part of it is kind of, like you said, um, having the the feeling that you're normal and that's or or maybe signaling to yourself that now I'm a man again with a with a functioning manhood 
therefore I have less reason to be socially anxious, but I definitely experienced it myself that as my kind of um, porn related issues improved, all areas of my life improved. And, and I guess just, just one question that I just popped up in my head is, do you think there's a benefit of kind of moderating other activities that are very kind of abusive <laughs> of our dopamine? So for example, video games and stuffing yourself with food, you know, doing these kinds of things that it's not related to porn directly, but it is related to dopamine. So do you think there's a benefit of um, playing around with these things? Well, absolutely. So the science is very strong now. Uh, if you go to my front page, you'll see there are about 30 studies, neurological studies that show the same addiction related brain changes that occur with drug addicts that are also occurring in heavy porn users. Now, if you go to internet addiction studies, there's about 200 brain studies and hundreds of more other studies. And these brain studies are showing the same addiction related brain changes that occur with addicts. And about six or seven of these internet addiction studies have followed uh, these internet addicts after they have quit and they've seen a reversal, not only of the brain changes, but a reversal of symptoms and even a reversal of some cognitive effects. In other words, they can think better, their frontal lobes are working better, uh, their memories better. So yeah, uh, you know, whenever did we sit in front of a screen clicking, clicking for 10 hours in a row, like some of these gamers do, or even five hours in a row. You know, when I was young, uh, we used to go out in the forest and play. I mean, I was right next to a forest and we pretend that we were Roman soldiers and we throw spears at each other or we climb trees or we pretend. So we were using our brains. We were playing all the time. And this is how humans, in fact, all animals have grown up. They've used their imagination. They've played. They've been outdoors. They've been interacting with people. Now is the first time ever that we sit in front of screen and in order to get our dopamine hit, we're just clicking a mouse, clicking a mouse, clicking a mouse with one little finger. That is so different from what we evolved to do. So obviously, I think, and you do too, that it can have negative effects. Yeah, definitely. It's funny you mentioned this. I just had a friend over at my place not that long ago, and we were in sitting in a couch playing Xbox for like, I don't know, 20 hours straight or something. And then we just said that this is basically the only time in history where two guys like us in our 20s, you know, are willing to spend two days in a row in a couch and not move. Like this would have been unimaginable at any other time in history. Like we would have gone out and meet people or do something fun. Uh, so yeah, it is really fascinating. It all comes back to the whole paleo concept, which gets a lot of flack in fitness and, and health circles. But it's not just about diet. It's about basically doing the things with, with your entire system, your brain, your body, and everything that basically evolution has prepared it for, right? Right. I mean, you can even step back from paleo and, and not say, okay, we're supposed to be eating primarily this or that. But it's clear what we're not supposed to be eating, and that's refined food. And that's... Yeah. You know, if you go back to Harvard, to Yale in the 60s, they were poo-pooing the so-called health food nuts. They said there's nothing wrong with sugar. You know, we get plenty of everything we need in the American diet with Wonder Bread and hamburgers and Twinkies and Hostess Pies. Everything's there because we just supply what you need. And now, of course, we see that diet is huge, that saturated fats, there's nothing wrong with that, really. You know, it's just about whole foods compared to processed foods. I mean, that's really what's going on. And what did we evolve with? What did we not evolve with? Well, you know, if you take a bunch of rats and you give them the American diet, they will pig out until about 100% of the rats are obese and they start coming down with uh, diabetes-like symptoms. So it's not normal. So I think the paleo people are on the right track is that there's how we grew up, how we evolved. And whatever you think is the right diet, we know that the current American diet that you can get at McDonald's isn't the right diet. 
sitting in front of a computer playing World of Warcraft for eight hours straight is not what we did in evolution. And sitting around and jerking off the porn starting at age 12 until 18 before you go out and kiss a girl is not what we did in evolution. Right. That's brilliantly said. And I want you th want to thank you for, for coming on. Just, just before um, I ask you where people can find you, perhaps just um, maybe some, some things that you wish to see in the future, future research or, or things that could help to spread the, your movement a little bit further, because obviously it, it, it should happen. <laughs> well, you know, the research is slow and coming because there's a lot of uh, resistance to uh, research around porn. And I just want to point something out, like uh, Valerie Boone of Cambridge University, one of the top neuroscientists in the world, uh, I actually had a little short conversation with her years ago when I was listening to a talk of hers, and she said she was amazed at the resistance to getting her research out about porn. And Simone Kuhn of Max Planck Institute, who also did a uh, research on the brains of porn users, said the same thing. So there's a tremendous amount of resistance. I just want to put that out there. But what type of uh, studies do we need? Well, we need studies where people remove the variable, where they stop using porn, and we follow them for several months. We monitor them before they stop using. We monitor after them, after they stop using, and we report the differences. That will then validate that porn use is causal in some of these problems. So that's the type of research I would like to see come out. Right, right. Well, let's let's hope that that happens sooner than later. All right, Gary, just uh, please tell the listeners where they can find you, your work, resources, anything you'd like to mention. Yeah, you can find my website, which is yourbrainonporn.com. It's commercial free. Everything there is free. If you want to get a book, I, I sell a book. It's called Your Brain on Porn, Internet Pornography and the Emerging Science of Addiction. And all the proceeds from that book go to charity. So everything on the website is free. There's no advertising. And you can find everything you need right there on the site. Awesome. Wonderful. Gary, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an honor. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, guys. I hope you found this podcast informative. If you hung out until the very end, well, I know there was a lot to take. So... I know that for some, it might be hard to believe what you just heard here. And if you had no issues that you developed as a result of porn use, that's great for you. And I wish honestly for you that you remain unaffected by it. But unfortunately, at this point, there are thousands of guys who did get impacted by this. And like I said, I was one of them. If you're curious, at some point I can share my own story in more detail. Maybe it can help some of you. If you're experiencing something like this, perhaps I can give you some advice or encouragement. So let me know if you'd like to see or hear something like that. But for now, let's sum up the main takeaways from this episode. Number one, the issue or potential issues with porn use is that you essentially wire your brain to get aroused in a kind of environment that is just very different from real life sex. It allows you to just watch instead of interact. It allows you to jump from one type of video to the next. In other words, from one kind of sexual modality to the next within seconds. Just with a mouse click, it allows you to wind the video forward to the exact moment that you're interested in and get aroused to that. And what's important to understand is that by doing this, you're providing a very powerful training to your brain to do this. You're essentially wiring yourself to get aroused and rewarded from doing this. And as a consequence, when you find yourself with a real partner, even though you might find her objectively attractive and would emotionally or psychologically desire being with her, the areas of your brain that are responsible for getting you aroused and turned on will simply not light up and fire as they should, hence erectile dysfunction in so many cases. And if this sounds really woo-woo, if you ask any neuroscientist, they will tell you that this is basically how the brain works. It gets trained to do certain things by repetition or by rewarding certain behaviors. Different pathways get formed in the brain and those pathways become ingrained more and more so this thing is very real, which brings me to the next point, which is that if you ran into this problem yourself, your next step, if you want to overcome it, is rewiring your brain to basically get aroused to real people and a real partner. Because again, 
what you did, if you did it, by watching porn for a long time, is that you trained your brain for the wrong sport. It's like training to play basketball by training golf. It doesn't work. So to change this non-optimal wiring, you want to first quit watching porn and depending on your situation, even stop masturbating for some time and then try to reintroduce real life intimacy into your life. Obviously, a supportive girlfriend or partner can be very helpful here. And additionally, if you're in this place right now, it can be a perfect time to try to bring up all areas of your life. For my usual audience, the advice to exercise and be healthy is a given, but try to socialize, get disconnected more, don't use your phone and computer so much, try to read books instead of watching TV and um, do these kinds of things. Try to embrace a bit more of a primal life. Um, this over time really does rewire your brain to do the right thing. And the last thing I'd like to mention here is the types of things you should expect if you embark on this recovery process. If you quit porn, that may or may not be very hard. And it depends whether or not you developed a porn addiction. But at any rate, it might be hard simply because of the habit that you developed. In that case, it might be helpful to, for example, not use your laptop at the places you usually watched porn, uh, for example, in your bedroom. But Quitting porn for me, for example, was n relatively easy. Now, if you quit masturbation too, which might be advisable if you develop porn-induced ED, that can be pretty rough. To me, the first two weeks, uh, I was incredibly horny. And then came this period they call a flatline where I was just absolutely not interested in sex whatsoever. For some guys, this period can last up to many months. For others, it's a couple of weeks or just a week. I only spent a couple of weeks in this state at a time. And then there were a couple of other things that started happening during this recovery process. I had blue balls many times, which is not much fun, but at least it gives you the feeling that the recovery is working. I started to have wet dreams occasionally, which never happened to me before. I thought that this only happened in these American Pie type of movies. My morning woods returned, which is another extremely common experience that guys who watch tons and tons of porn and masturbate to it stop having morning woods. And well, that will return during the recovery as well. And lastly, over time, your old sexual desire returns. And you will, after a long time, discover again how it feels to be truly turned on by your girlfriend or partner. So guys, if you're in this situation or know someone who's in this situation, just know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and there is a way out. So I hope you enjoyed this episode or found it informative. Please leave a rating on iTunes to support this show or subscribe to the channel to support my YouTube channel. Uh, share this around for people who might find it informative. Uh, it would mean a lot to me. And yes, thank you for your attention. So see you next time.